Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much indeed for coming. Um, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me at the back? Good. And if you can't hear me, put your hand up so that I will know. Uh, now, my subject today is the Arda chalice, which you see here, ringed, and it was discovered as part of a hoard, which you see on the screen, uh, at this, in the bank of this ring ford at Rirastha, near the village of Arda, in the county of Limerick, in Munster, in the south of Ireland. The chalice itself is probably 8th century in date. The hoard was buried in possibly the late 9th, early 10th century. Now, it's a vessel to hold the Eucharistic wine at Mass, when it would have been used together with a strainer, a pattern, and a book for readings. And as you see, uh, the body of the chalice is made of silver, and it's decorated with the most precious materials available in Ireland at that time, namely some more silver, gold, copper, rock crystal, glass gems, and amber. The overall shape of this chalice, uh, like some other early medieval chalices, like the one you see here from Syria in the bottom uh, left of the screen, this is derived from the classical cantharis, as indeed uh, the, is the shape of the Derin Fran uh, chalice, which you see above the Arda chalice here on the screen, discovered over a hundred years later. Uh, thus, it will have a... Hmm, a two handles connected to a relatively large bowl linked to a stem connected to a relatively small foot. And of course, both being a chalice, both the Syrian example and the Arda chalice have a Christian um, icon there, a, a Cairo in the case of the Syrian chalice, and a cross of arcs, a fairly well-known way of representing the cross in early medieval in the early, late antique and early medieval world, and that's the symbol we have on the Arda chalice. It's actually a fairly common way of representing the cross, not only uh, across Europe, but also in Ireland itself, as you see, a cross of arcs because it's designed by a compass. Uh, now, I'm going to be drawing attention to ornament on lots of different parts of this chalice. And as you're probably not all as familiar with it as I am, we're going to start off with a tour of the chalice and a naming of parts. Uh, now, as you see, we've already seen the bowl, silver, the handles, the stem, which is quite elaborate, actually cast, uh, it's copper, and then it's gilt, and then the silver foot, and the cross of arcs, which we've already seen. But in addition, there is a bowl garland. Now that runs right around the perimeter of the bowl, right under the handles, and it's panels of gold uh, which are divided from each other by elaborate glass studs. Then beneath the bowl girdle is an inscription that's rather hard to see, I know, but um, you will see it in more detail in a moment. Uh, then under the a handle is a, an elaborate handle escutcheon, which again we'll see more closely in a moment. And even the foot is decorated with an upper foot ring, more panels subdivided by studs. Now, looking underneath the chalice, we again see the, the bowl girdle, the handle, the handle escutcheon, which you can see more clearly here, and of course the round with the cross of arcs. But in addition, we have another foot ring underneath the foot here on the lower foot ring. Um, then we have an extremely elaborate underfoot disc in the centre and right in the centre, a very spectacular crystal. Now, what's happened with the chalice was that in the early 1960s, the bowl was wobbling on the stem. And so it was sent to London uh, for conservation to the British Museum because at that stage, the National Museum of Ireland did not have its own uh, state-of-the-art research lab. Uh, so when it was there, the chance was taken to examine it very carefully to identify the various techniques of manufacture using the latest uh, scientific instruments available at the research lab at the time. And the results of that scientific examination were published in 1973 in the States by Robert Orkin, whom you see here in old age, uh, quite a recent photograph, he died relatively recently, and that was published in 1973. Now, unfortunately, some of the work that was done on the chalice uh, in that period in London has not seen the light of day and it has fallen to me to edit it 
and um, I shall be doing that, or I am doing that, on behalf of the National Museum of Ireland, which will publish the results, um, particularly a uh, very important paper on the glass studs by Mavis Bimson, for example, off the British Museum Research Lab, but also we'll have some new papers. Uh, and so that will be published by the National Museum of Ireland, hopefully, we hope, uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, as I've said, the techniques of manufacture have been examined very carefully and published uh, by Robert Organ in an extremely clear paper. But what hasn't really been systematically looked at is the iconography. There have been some sporadic papers, but not that many. So one chapter in this book by me will consider the iconography. And I have given a preliminary version of this paper uh, at the latest Insular Art Conference, which was held in Galway two years ago, and thereby hangs a tale, as you will see later on in this talk. Right, well, the chalice, so now down to the iconography. The chalice is, um, it is a, a communion vessel to be used at the Mass, uh, and the Mass recalls crucifixion, the resurrection, and the promise of eternal salvation, because it is a liturgical reenactment of the Last Supper when Jesus breast the bread and the wine and gave it to the apostles. And the text is here, the relevant text is here on the screen, the one about the chalice in green at the bottom of the screen from Matthew's Gospel. And I don't really need to read it to you because I'm sure it's pretty familiar to you. Uh, now, looking at the iconography of this uh, object, the question is, did it affect the form as well as the decoration? And I'm going to start by considering the form, because um, at Golgotha there was a relic uh, which was believed to be the actual chalice used at the Last Supper, and it was viewed by pilgrims, including uh, the one whose uh, visit is reported uh, by the abbot of Iona, Adovnon, in De Locis Sanctus. And his description of the chalice is very interesting in this context because he says, and it's in green at the bottom of the screen, the chalice is silver, it has the measure of a Gaulish pint, therefore it was fairly big, whatever a Gaulish pint was, and it has two handles fashioned on either side. Now, it was suggested as long ago as 1932 by Liam Gogan that this description of the relic at Golgotha was the exemplar for the last chalice. Uh, and I think that's quite likely to be correct, but can't be proved. But what can be proved is that the Last Supper was very definitely in the minds of the designers of the, of the Ardai Chalice, because the names of the 12 apostles who were present are inscribed in display script against a speckled background uh, in, right under the Bolgardel, as I mentioned a moment ago. Um, and in fact, there are the 12 apostles with, of course, uh, I'm afraid Judas doesn't figure. He, Paul comes in as a substitute and he's named at the beginning of the list. Um, and the point about this is actually reinforced by the fact that there are 12 uh, gold panels above this inscription and 12 uh, very elaborate ornate glass studs. Um, now, I'm not going to go into this because I don't have time. But it was suggested uh, in 1984 by the late Hilary Richardson that a number of the uh, ornaments on the chalice actually do reflect sacred numbers. And she pointed out that it's clear that this was system was understood in Ireland because it's referred to in the Stowe Missal and by Erugina as well. And there is a reference to her paper if you're interested in following this up. But meanwhile, back to the inscription. Uh, here we have the, the beginning of the list, Petri, Pauli, Andre, Andre uh, with an honorific pi at the beginning of Peter and Paul's name rather than a Greek P, and there's Andrew's name, and there's even a little, uh, you may not see it, but there are tiny little crosses, equal art crosses, following uh, Peter and Paul's name to, I think, honour them. Um, now, the sharp-eyed among you will have observed that this inscription is not in the nominative. It's actually in the genitive case. And Tom O'Loughlin, who has looked at this inscription, um, has said that if this was supposed to be a list which was simply in mem it just in memory of the apostles, it would, the list would be in the nominative, and if it was a list dedicated to them, it should be in the dative. But it's not, it's in the genitive. And why? 
here, here you are, here are the names. Um, the last two names are, are actually in the nominative, but all the orange names there, they're all in the genitive. Um, now, Tom thinks that uh, the nominative at the end is simply a careless mistake, and the genitive is the intended um, case, and he's published his results here in the Journal of Celtic Studies in 2005. And what he suggested is that this use of the genitive suggests that it's derived uh, from the liturgy, from the communicantis section of the Eucharistic prayer of the Roman Rite. And, and this is, is supported by, in fact, the edition of Paul, starting with Peter and Paul. Now, this prayer is recorded in the late 8th century Irish stone missal, so it was certainly known in Ireland. And the implication of this in Tom's opinion, is that this inscription is not only in memory of the apostles, but it's also a prayer to them to be present in communion with the faithful during the liturgical ceremony. Uh, of course, the Last Supper was followed by the crucifixion, and we've already seen the cross of Ox in a very prominent position in the centre of the bowl <coughs> on both the front and the back of the chalice. And there's an extremely subtle detail on what I think must be the front of the chalice, because it's the side where the list starts with Peter and Paul. And I'm drawing attention to here with these little arrows. The top picture on the screen is looking down on the chalice from above. And I hope you can see there are two stud collars right across the cross of arcs. And each is ringed by a gold stud collar. And the little red arrows are pointing at that. Now, these are the only two uh, stud collars on the bowl garden with uh, gold rings. All the rest are encircled by silver stud collars, as indeed is even the stud collar on the cross of arcs itself. So this seems to me to be a way of focusing on the front of the chapter and another little bit of honouring, uh, in this case, the cross. The cross of arcs itself is jewelled, and it's probably, therefore, uh, a refers to the jewelled cross uh, which stood at the spot where Christ was believed to be crucified at Golgotha. Uh, but there's another very subtle uh, link here, and that is the Last Supper is linked to the, um, to the cross because the margin, and it's much clearer, in fact, on the bottom of the screen here in the drawing, uh, if you see the, arrow, the top arrow, orange arrow points to where the angle changes, the margin surrounding the inscription deviates, goes round the bottom half of the cross and ends uh, in uh, two uh, lion heads here. So this is a very subtle way of linking the Last Supper with what followed the crucifixion. And the choice of lion heads is probably also symbolic. Um, I think they are lions because, as you see, they have manes and they're not at all unlike the lion here on the um, Book of Kells because the lion is another symbol uh, a Christological symbol. It's the Lion of Judah, that's Christ, but it also um, symbolises the crucifixion and the resurrection, because in the Physiologus, which is reiterated, this detail is reiterated by Isidore of Seville, in the Etymologia, uh, the Lion is sent to symbolise the crucifixion because it was believed that even while it slept, its eyes were watchful just as when Christ slept on the cross, his divine nature kept watch. That's a quotation. And of course, the lion symbolizes the resurrection because of the extremely picturesque belief that little lion cubs were born dead, but on the third day, they were brought to life by their father, <coughs> breathing and roaring on them, just as Christ arose from the dead on the third day. So here is probably yet another Christological symbol, and there is perhaps yet another one here, and that is in the form of uh, these serpents. I hope you can see them. There are paired serpents on the cross arms here. They're splayed cross arms. Each of these splayed cross arms has got a pair of serpents. You can see their little heads seen from above. And this may be um, a reference to a passage in John's Gospel, uh, and I quote it, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that's the brazen serpent, even so, the Son of God must be lifted up, i.e. the comparing the brazen serpent with the crucifixion. And it's very interesting that when Benedict Bispop went to Rome and came back with some panel paintings, um, they were paired, and one of the pairs indeed did represent, we're told by Bede, uh, the brazen serpent paired with the crucifixion. So this, this concept of linking these two things is in the air, 
And Hedda Pulliam has pointed out that on the marginal ornament in the Book of Kells, um, serpents are particularly concentrated beside the passage describing the Passion, but not only that, at the moment when the Eucharist is instituted at the Last Supper. So again, this ornament may not be accidental, it may not just be mere embellishment. And continuing with this line of thought, yet another possible crucif uh, cru Christological symbol is this uh, uh, very prominent uh, crystal um, under the foot. Uh, now the argument for this as being a Christological symbol comes from a statement by Gregory the Great in his homily in Jerusalem. Um, he follows Pliny in believing that crystal is actually formed of frozen uh, water, and I quote, moist, frozen moisture from the sky falling as pure snow, so it's very pure. And there's a, a, an extremely long simile uh, in Gregory's homily, which I can't possibly read the whole thing, but I'll just read a little bit. Crystal hardens from water and becomes fine. So this is following Pliny. The body of our Redeemer was somewhat similar to water. Through the glory of that body's resurrection, it changes from corruption to the perfection of incorruption. It grew hard just as crystal hardens from water. And Ginevra Cornwood, who has actually drawn attention to this uh, passage, has suggested that this is the reason that um, the crucifixion is so frequently engraved on a crystal in uh, Carolingian art, and, th and there is an example. Now here is uh, the actual crystal from the um, Art Art Chalice, and as you can see, it's quite markedly domed. That's it, taken out of its setting um, <coughs> when it was being examined in the British Museum. Right, now another suggestion, unpublished as yet by my friend Connor Newman, uh, but which he kindly allows me to refer to <coughs> is, he has pointed out uh, the domed nature of this dot and compared it to the well-known dome over the edicule over the tomb of Christ. And here is a depiction of it, an early depiction. I think it's 6th century. And he's also drawn attention to the number of rings around the um, around this uh, stud and compared it to the depiction of the Holy Sepulchre in the Vienna Codex of Adevnon's De Locus Sanctus. Now, this is incapable of proof, of course, but it is a very interesting idea. Um, but to return to the cross, um, as we saw, the most prominent motif on the chalice is, of course, the cross of ox on the front and the back. But this is by no means the only cross on the chalice. There are really quite a large number of crosses of diverse forms executed in different techniques all over the chalice. And then this, again, it recalls the Book of Kells, uh, and I'm quoting here Bernard Meehan in his recent book about the Book of Kells, the cross occurring on almost every page of the manuscript in myriad sizes and forms. That's certainly reminiscent of the chalice. It was a constant reminder of the major preoccupation of the Christian Methodist, that's Christ's sacrifice on the cross and its redemptive function. So let's start. Well, now, you've seen the cross of ox before, but what I did not point out is that not only do you have a very prominent cross, a jewel cross, but the jewel in the centre of the cross actually uh, depicts a little cross, another little cross. So you have a cross within a cross, and this is precisely what you get, actually, on the cross of ox in the uh, Book of Doral as well. So this is, seems to be a standard device in the insular world in this period. Uh, but that is by no means all. Now we look at the um, glass pseudo-crozone gems on the bowl girdle and also on the handless scutcheon. And the patterns there, they're quite diverse, but with one exception, they're cruciform. There's one, that's that one. There's another one, another cruciform pattern. There's yet another one. This one's on the handless scutcheon. There, that stud, blue and yellow, blue and gold and uh, red stud there at the base of the handless scutcheon and there's another one I think up there. So again we have repetition of cross patterns, little ones, and now we move down to the upper foot ring and lo and behold we have further crosses. This time they are equal arm crosses. There are two types. The studs are all basically blue glass studs um, but on some you have little red uh, crosses with yellow corners. That's the ones on the 
that side, the far side, and you have some, on others you have the opposite, you have little yellow crosses with blue corners. And there is, in the bottom of row, you see a painted start from the Book of Kells, which, to my eye at least, looks like a, a, a start of this type, which must have been more common, um, painted on the Book of Kells. And that's not all. Now we look under the chalice at the lower foot ring, and what do we have? This time we have swastikas. Um, they are uh, made with a punch on copper plates. Uh, some of them have got a green inlay, and the British Museum team couldn't decide if that was simply a corrosion product or if it was a deliberate inlay. But if you look at the panel as a whole there, likewise a British Museum photograph, you can see, I hope, that the swastika is very clearly depicted. And staying with the lower foot ring, there are further crosses here. Now these ones are harder to see because they're actually hidden in interlace. And they are on four panels which the arrows point to. These are four panels, they're press plate panels, they're all stamped from the same die, so the basic pattern is identical. And um, that's one of them below, so right, to see these crosses, we have to follow the advice of Gerald of Wales, who was a very perceptive observer of Insurata. This comes from his famous description of a lost gospel book from St. Bridget's Monastery in Kildare, which sounds rather like the Book of Kells. He said, we have to penetrate with our eyes to the secrets of the artistry, and that's what we have to do here. So, right. So here we have above ringed, I hope you can see, we have one cross and equal uh, a cross with splayed arms and then there's another one there beside it and there's a third one on that panel there are three hidden crosses concealed in interlace on these four pan each of these four panels and there it is now again it's by no means unique uh, here we have the self same motif this time with just two crosses concealed in interlace on the tall cross at monster boys uh, later than the Arda Chalice, late 9th or early 10th century. So this again is uh, something which was well understood um, in the, the uh, Christian among the Christian artists of this period. Um, and again, well, it, it's not only there. Here's the Book of Kells. There are some hidden crosses there in interlace. Off we go. I hope you can see them. And we now go to the Lindisfarne Gospels. There's a cross here, but there are crosses within the cross. There they go, lots of them. There they are. So again, the idea of the cross, of course, is the chief Christian emblem symbolizing redemption through crucifixion. And it is the chief, uh, the cross in isolation is one of the most important motifs on the Arda Chalice. But what I would now hope to demonstrate to you that you also have the cross in combination with other motifs. And the first uh, version, which we will discuss, is what Egon Vamers uh, described as a central motif complex in Christian art in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. That is, the cross surrounded by representatives of the three genera of creation as described in Genesis, that's creatures of the land, of waters, air and land. In other words, fish, birds and beasts. Now this does seem a rather curious idea, uh, and the idea, it goes back to St. Paul um, and to uh, the, one of the church fathers, Irenaeus, uh, who argued, drawing on St. Paul, that Christ should be seen as a second Adam, because what he does is he comes along and does the damage done by the first Adam through his sacrifice on the cross. And in the process, creation is renewed. The world is created afresh. <coughs> and therefore, through the crucifixion, not only you have a new world, and of course you have a new creation, including all these uh, uh, categories of animal. And therefore, the cross surrounded by the three genera of creation becomes a standard motif signifying redemption. Now, there is no canon for the depiction of this motif. It is shown in all sorts of different ways. Um, here is one completely explicit way um, from the uh, Essen Verden portable altar, that's uh, 8th century. I hope you can see quite clearly crucified Christ with uh, Rex above his head. And right above that, we have two winged creatures, creatures of the air. Beside him, there are no less than four fish, 
creatures of the water, and below his beside his legs, these little creepy crawlies, clearly creatures of the land, quadrupeds. So that's one way of depicting it. But there are plenty of others. Here we have the um, older Lindau Gospel cover. There the cross spans the entire cover, but there's a very narrow margin around the perimeter. And on the older parts, which I've ringed there in yellow, in as Gunter Hasnoff's drawing shows, we have enamel panels, and what do they show? They show creatures of the, la the, the <coughs> land, creatures of the water, and creatures of the air. So this is yet another way of depicting this motif. But we, you can, it can really go quite wild, uh, the way this motif is depicted. Here's the Gelasian Sacramentary, um, 8th century Merovingian, and we have no less than three different types of bird here. There's a pair crouching on the cross arms, another pair hanging from the alpha and the omega, and yet another little pair, different, different type, you see, they're all different, and they are eating, I presume, they are consuming, getting spiritual nourishment from the tree of life. So there are our creatures of the air, we have creatures of the land in the various roundels on the cross, and indeed over here we have a deer. So, right, creatures of the air, creatures of the land, and how about creatures of the water? Well, they're the most charming of all, in my opinion. There's one fish, but below, what do we have? The word Novaris, written in fish, with a few little birds on the capital of the initial, but that's it. Now, coming closer to home, to the Celtic, whatever that means, world, uh, the late and much lamented Carola Hicks uh, pointed out that the self-same motif is depicted on the Lullingston hanging bow. And, and there are crosses, as she noted. There they are. There are birds, uh, fish, uh, by the way, which I've arrowed, and of course, so sorry, I've gone backwards, but creatures. There was deer as well, therefore creatures of the land. So, this uh, is known in the insular world, and in my opinion, you find it on the Arva Chalice, but really quite hard to see until you really start to look. Now, where are these creatures? Well, we return to our panels here, the four panels with the hidden crosses, because uh, there are fish on this panel as well. Now, I have to tell you, I didn't see these at all until I gave a lecture in Dublin, and I proudly pointed out the hidden crosses, and the members of the audience shouted out, Neil, Neil, they're fish. Look, they're fish. I went away and I looked, and sure enough, what did I find? But this little pair of fish, very like the fish on the moon high cross below. This is a panel depicting the miracle of the loaves and fishes. But you see there's these fat fish, then face-to-face -face little kissing fishes, and one is picked out above emerging from the interlace in pink and the other in green. But as you see on the moon panel, there are two types of fish here. You've got the flat fish and you've got some skinnier ones. And as pointed out to me by the members of this audience, there are, they think, and I agree, now that I've seen them, little fish in the corners, rather like uh, this fish in the Book of Kells there immediately above. I hope you see the eye of that little fish, which I, I've, I've point, uh, ringed him there in... Um, in a tear-shaped yellow ring. And there are actually four of these. Now here we are, there's the panel as a whole, then we have in the middle here the kissing fish, and then below in the corners there are four little fish emerging from the corner. So, three crosses and four fish on this panel. Those are the only fish I've been able to find on the chalice, so they're the creatures of the water. But creatures of the air, there are a number of examples, but I'm going to just pick out one. Uh, and that's fish uh, birds on two panels on the gold filigree panels on the bowl girdle. And here again, we return to Geraldus, and we really have to struggle because his description of the ornament on the Book of Kildare certainly applies here when he said, Such intricacies, so delicate and subtle, so close together and well knitted, so involved and bound together. But there are birds here, and I hope to persuade you. Now, to pick them out, what um, I've done. Uh, with the aid of uh, the finished product being done by the archaeological illustrator Will Foster, colour-coded um, the various elements. And there, that colour-coded drawing below shows what's there, and there's not an extra line, it's only what's there. And there I hope you see uh, the eye of a bird, and it's got a very long beak, which extends into the corner. And on the other side there's another eye of a bird with a shorter beak. But I know that's still quite hard to see, so we need to isolate the individual motifs. And here in Will's um, 
drawings, we have them. Now, we're starting at the top left of the panel, and here is, there's a little bird uh, ahead, and I hope you can see it with that very long beak going into the corner again. Uh, there is its wing, there is its leg, and it's got an exceptionally elaborate tail. Now, although I may have been pretty um, courageous about identifying various species hitherto, um, I, I don't like to say categorically that this might be a highly stylized peacock, but it might be, because that would be a very appropriate motif on the chalice because of the belief that the peacock's flesh did not putrefy like Christ as rises, it survives death, in other words. Now, there are four of these very elaborate creatures, and then in between them are actually a, a different creature, a slightly odder creature. This is a, a bird head, but with a fish tail. And so they, are, they form the trefoil knots on the overall patterns. So there we have creatures of the air, and there are other examples, but I don't have time to go into that. And finally, creatures of the land. Now, the simplest way to find these are to look at the engravings. We've already seen the engraved lions with their manes and their rather snub, uh, cat-like noses. Uh, so we have lions. If we look at the engraving under the bowl, uh, under the hand escutcheons, there are different beasts. These ones have got long, long muzzles and rather ferocious teeth, and I personally think that they look like hounds. And actually, in there are references in the old Irish tale in Bo Freak, the cattle raid of Freak, uh, to um, a, a, a stringed instrument, probably a lyre, being decorated with birds, snakes, and hunting dogs. Meal cook, that's the, the word in Old Irish. And I think that that's what these are. And then uh, at the top of the handle, a scotch, and there are some other little creatures, and uh, there I hesitate to identify them. Are they calves? Are they lambs? I don't know. I think we can't be sure. But they're a different species. And there's yet another species on the, in the filigree panels on the bowl girdle. And uh, they are different. Um, and so I will now hope to show them to you. They have, there's the eye of the head. Um, I'm going to try to show them with the pointer. There's the eye, there's the, the, the mouth, long neck, shoulder spiral, long leg. Is this coming up? Yes. And then the body goes round. There's the hip spiral and the hind leg with the hind foot, and this very curious feature, a straight horn. Um, just pointing them out again. There's the shoulder. There's the, one of the forelegs, uh, the shoulder, and the hind leg, and, oh, that's the tail, which goes right off to the far corner, and then this curious feature. Now, there are four panels decorated with this same motif. Two of these creatures in each panel, and each of these creatures has this one, so it's not an accident. What is it? Well, there are goats in the Book of Kells, but I do not see this as a goat because the horn is not sloping backwards as it is on the fairly naturalistic representation of the goat in the Book of Kells. Uh, it's not, an, an, it's not a, an, a, um, a stag either because they knew how to show stags. Here is a stag from a fillery panel on the Derren Fan pattern. What I personally think it is, is a unicorn. Um, that's the only thing that makes sense to me uh, with this single horn on each of the creatures. Now, if this is a correct identification, that's yet another Christological symbol. Uh, Ambrose of Milan, I quote, who then is this unicorn but the only begotten son of God? Uh, Basil of Caesarea, Christ will be called the son of unicorns. And back to Isidore of Seville and the Physiologus, there's an extremely elaborate allegory in which a unicorn is trapped by a maiden. She represents the Virgin Mary, and the unicorn stands for Christ descending into the Virgin womb and thus the incarnation. So I hope I have persuaded you that we definitely have the cross surrounded by the three genera of creation on the Arda Chalice. But that is not the only uh, motif complex on the chalice in I Am Now Persuaded. Now, I mentioned uh, at the beginning the Insular Conference two years ago in Galway. And at that conference um, was uh, Michael Clark, who is Professor of Classics at the university there. And Michael heard my lecture and went away, sent me a most excited email saying, unicorns need of music to my ears because he um, 
now thinks that uh, there is another reference on the Ardai Chalice, and that is to Psalm 21 in the Vulgate. Uh, this is a psalm which is alluded to repeatedly in the Gospels as a prophecy of the crucifixion, and indeed it is quoted, uh, the opening lines are quoted in the account of the Passion when he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, now the prophet is having an extremely hard time in this psalm. He's been tormented by, among other things, the power of the dog, the lion's mouth, and the horns of the unicorn. And what do we have? Quite independently suggested by me on the Ardai Chalice, but in my opinion, lions, hounds, and unicorns. Now, Michael Clark has pointed out that um, if this is what we have in the on the Ardai Chalice, it would not be unique in the period, or roughly the period, because uh, in the wonderful Stuttgart Psalter here, uh, which uh, illustrates each of the psalms. We have the illustrations of this self-same psalm actually does show the crucified Christ, who you can see there on this side, there he is, on the cross, <coughs> and what is around him but a unicorn with the uh, horn of the unicorn right uh, touching his, um, his, uh, uh, the corner, his, um, under his armpit. We have a lion, and on the other folio, the facing folio, we have dogs actually biting him. So, um, and indeed, the Eucharistic imagery is explicitly referred to here uh, because there is an actual chalice, presumably catch the holy blood of the Eucharist, uh, between the unicorn and the lion. So I am persuaded that this is a correct identification um, on the Ardar chalice, and it's not just found in the Carolingian period it's on um, the, the Stuttgart Psalter. Egon Vammers has argued that it's also found on this um, dish, which he says suggests is a pix, um, the, the Holdenmore cup. Uh, and as you see, there are a number of roundels. I think there are four roundels on this object. And uh, looking at the drawing at the bottom, there's a lion in two, um, emerging for the foliage between each round, in my opinion, are hounds, heads, and then in the round which we see uh, illustrated above, there is what Egon Vamers has suggested is a unicorn. Now, it has been suggested, and if you look at the BM website, you will find that this creature is identified as um, a bull, and that would also be consistent with uh, Psalm 21, because a another creature harrying the, um, the psalmist is actually a bull, but try as I might, there's no way I can see any bulls on the Ardai Chalice. But it's interesting that we just have three of the creatures here on the um, Holton Moor uh, uh, pig or dish as well. And I mean, the, the argument is that there is quite clear genitalia shown on the bulls here in the uh, Stuttgart sort, but none on the, uh, the uh, vessel. And indeed, the horns also are quite different. So I am persuaded that we actually have the same the same assemblage on this dish as we have uh, on the Arda chalice. And uh, interestingly, Martin Hennig has suggested that Psalm 21 is referred to in a much earlier period on the Hinton St. Mary pavement, uh, which is clearly Christological. There is Christ with the Cairo behind him, and below you see a detail where you see a hound hurrying a deer. So this, like the um, the uh, motif of the cross surrounded by the three genera, this may, it seems to be maybe a long-standing uh, Christological image. So to conclude, um, first of all, it seems to me that the decoration of the Ardai Chalice is rich in Christian symbolism, which can be read on a number of different levels. Now, the, clearly, the overall theme is redemption through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But the Christian message is proclaimed by many decorative elements individually, as well as by elements in combination, referring to both the three genera of creation and to the foretelling of the crucifixion in Psalm 21. Uh, so the iconography of the chalice, to me at least, now appears to be every bit as sophisticated and complex as the techniques and the variety of its decoration, which have hitherto been the main study of study. Uh, now, Clearly, the style and the technique, as we see in this panel here from the Bulgarian, are typically Irish, 
But the message of the ornament is a basic Christian one that can only be understood in the broader context of the scriptures, biblical exegesis, and art in very different styles from other parts of the late antique and medieval world. And before concluding, I must acknowledge that of the help I have had from very many sources, and here they are. So thank you very much indeed.